Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Raheem Thompson. I'm the manager of public programs. On behalf of our CEO, Susan Abrams, and the entire museum, I would like to thank you all for joining us tonight for, for our panel discussion, Justice Delayed, Wrongful Incarceration from Mandela to Today with Floyd Stafford, Dr. Latanya, Jennifer Sublette, and our moderator, Dr. Lisa Lee. Dr. Lee is a cultural activist and the executive director of the National Public Housing Museum. She is an associated professor in art history and gender and women's studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago. She is a teaching uh, faculty member with the Prison Neighborhood Art Project and a member of the Chicago Torture Justice Memorials. Dr. Lee served as a co-chair of Mayor Lori Lightfoot's Art and Culture Transition Team and is, a, and is currently on the Mayor's Committee for Evaluation of Monuments, Memorials, and Historical Reckoning. She is currently a board member of the Field Foundation's 3A Arts and the Illinois State Museum. I'm so excited to have Dr. Lee moderating this panel. And before I turn it over to her to, to announce our panelists, I would like to say thank you to all of our community partners that were listed on the screen prior to the start of the event. Great. Good evening, everyone. And thanks to the wonderful Raheem Thompson and other organizers at the Illinois Holocaust Museum and fellow panelists. And thanks to all of you who are tuning in. You could be anywhere in the virtual world and we're so glad you're here with us today. Today is Earth Day. And I want to begin with a land acknowledgement to recognize the indigenous people who stored the land that we occupy in the United States. The National Public Housing Museum, the museum I direct, is located in Chicago, a city whose name is derived from the Algonquian name, which means river with shores lined with wild leaks. Chicago is home to many indigenous nations, including the Three Fires Confederacy, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi people. Following the settler violence culminating in the Black Hawk War of 1832, and the 1833 Treaty of Chicago, many indigenous people were forcibly removed from these territories or killed. Over a century later, under a different set of government policies called the Indian Relocation Act of 1956, many indigenous nations found themselves once again coerced to move, but this time back to the urban centers where their ancestors were originally dispossessed. Today, Chicago has the third largest urban native population in the United States with more than 65,000 Native Americans in the greater metropolitan area. As a museum professional and cultural activist, I strive to remember and understand this violent history and honor this place we inhabit. Thank you. I'm really thrilled to be on a panel today with two extraordinary activists who are working to bend the arc of justice and engage in such important movement building social justice work. First, it's my pleasure to introduce Floyd Stafford, who is the Senior Project Manager in National Initiatives, Research and Policy at the Heartland Alliance, and the co-founder of the Alumni Association, a visionary peer support network for the formerly incarcerated, which I can't wait to hear more about. Floyd has been involved for more than a decade in programs and initiatives that support those who have been impacted by the criminal justice system. He has a master's degree in social work and health administration and policy from the University of Chicago. Also joining us for tonight's conversation is Latanya Jennifer Sublet. Latanya is a mental health worker, a social justice advocate, and a director of peer reentry programs for Chicago Torture Justice Center. She experienced abuse and torture at the hands of Chicago police at the age of 19. Sentenced to 42 years in the Illinois Department of Corrections for a crime she did not commit, she reinvented herself. During her 21 year incarceration, she studied law, business and social justice. She earned two bachelor's degrees and she currently works as a mental health case manager for also for Heartland Alliance's health outreach team. Latanya is an active member of several social justice organizations and advocates for human rights and prison reform and sentencing reform. These organizations include the Worker Center for Racial Justice, the Harm Reduction, All of Us or None, Advisory Board for Men and Women's Reentry for Prison Ministry, and she sits in official capacity as a survivor and family board member of the Chicago Torture Justice Center. 
Latanya has also spoken at the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Educational Center Purchase Live Slavery Exhibit, and she was asked to also narrate a selection of the Holocaust Museum's Nelson Mandela exhibit and tour. Welcome, both of you. So excited to be in conversation with you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So today's panel is held on the occasion of the museum's exhibit about Nelson Mandela and the freedom struggle. So I just want to begin before we even start talking about your work now, you know, asking you, how did Nelson Mandela and the South African movement and the fight against apartheid influence you in your work? Um, Floyd, do you want to start? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, first of all, I just want to say thank you to the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center for um, having me be a panelist tonight, speaking about um, Nelson Mandela. And, um, you know, to your question, Lisa, um, I think about um, in the opening um, how Mandela said that I cherish the idea of a democratic and free society in which all people will live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. So um, part of my identity um, is, you know, along with being an African-American man here in um, the United States, I'm someone who has a criminal record. So I'm a formerly incarcerated person. And I think about the lack of opportunities that many individuals have in this country, but in particular, those um, who have the mark of a criminal record. Uh, so a lot of my work um, is shaped around, and a lot of my identity is shaped around being an advocate, um, being able to inform policy and legislation, um, as well as um, innovative, thoughtful programs that can help um, individuals have a second chance in society. So I would say, like, um, while I was, um, you know, going through the virtual exhibit, um, there were many times when I just stopped and reflected uh, um, 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 in regards to the parallels um, in my own life and then um, what was going on in South America, uh, South Africa, rather, um, during apartheid. So um, it, it was, um, yeah, there's a lot of parallels with Mandela and how I look at myself and my work with reentry. Yeah, wonderful. Um, Latanya? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm so happy to be here. But again, um, like Floyd said, definitely the parallels, I don't think, that I absolutely um, considered them until you actually begin the fight. When, while you're incarcerated, you really, really don't know um, how much of a fight you will have even afterwards. So for Mandela to me, immediately my thought was first and foremost from prison to president. So I'm thinking if Mandela can do it under those circumstances, not that I wanted to be a uh, president, but I knew that I would have the opportunity to succeed. But really when I think about it, um, at one time the thought was this is South Africa. Things like that don't happen here in the United States. However, having been formerly incarcerated, I see that I am still faced and individuals who are formerly incarcerated are faced with the same systems that say what we can and what we cannot do. And it does happen here in America. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, I just wanna say that I think about a trip that I took in 2009 to South Africa led by Prexy Nesbitt, a wonderful social justice warrior and when we went to Robbins Island on the visit, the tour guides are all formerly incarcerated people there. Mm -hmm. And they told a beautiful story of how um, this incredibly unjust system in the prisons demanded that they just distribute food rations yeah. based on the color of skin. And so if you were whiter, you would get more food. And if you were blacker, you would get less food. And Mandela led the prisoners in pooling the food and then redistributing it in an act of resistance and creating sort of humanity, even in places where they would dehumanize everyone. And um, it was a beautiful story. And I often think of that story till today about how we can work in solidarity and even in the face of the most unjust systems create beauty truth and justice you know where we work 
Um, and that's and that's definitely what you all are doing in your efforts. And so I maybe want to start with Latanya. And can you talk a little bit about the movement building you're engaged in now and just share with us your efforts to create justice um, within the prison industrial complex and what's happening? So really, my personal um, goal is to eliminate the um, disparities in the collateral consequences that um, those of us who are formerly incarcerated face upon our release. So that is, is really what I am working on personally. There are so many things that um, people say, you know, you're free, just get out and get a job. But I don't think that the large larger uh, society really understands how restricted we are and how um, isolated that can make us feel. So with Chicago Torture Justice Center, I'm definitely a part of that movement, but I kind of feel like I'm always all over the place doing many different things, um, but that is is one of my, um, th that is that is my, my, my personal thing, housing, employment, um, getting rid of this registry for individuals. I'm on a, a coalition that is working against the, the murder registry that everybody has to register upon their release. So personally, I want, I may not be able to, you know, absolutely stop the carceral system by myself. I support individuals and make sure when they come home that I have some support there for them. What I want to see in this society is a absolute second chance. And that's not what we have. The registry, again, puts us out there saying, I am still yet a murderer. This is where I live. We, we're still reporting, although we are free. So I seek to create um, a free indeed uh, lifestyle. That's, that's really what I'm hoping for. Yeah, and just before we move on, can you maybe share a little bit with the audience, you know, what the Chicago Torture Justice Center is, this amazing um, sort of, you know, group that emerged from a historic fight to achieve reparations in the city of Chicago, and some people out there may not know, so maybe just tell a little bit about CTJC, perhaps? Absolutely. So um, just like you said, CTJC arrived as part of a reparations package. The city of Chicago finally acknowledged and said, yes, there were individuals from 1971 until 1970, 1993 who were tortured. They specifically called out John Burge, but there is acknowledgement that he was not the first and he is definitely not the last. And there were hundreds of um, African-American Latinx men and women who were tortured and abused um, at many of the police stations, Area 2, Home and Square, um, and they were tortured to uh, sign confessions, which is how they got their convictions. So there was a fight, a big fight. Rahm Emanuel finally said, okay, so CTJC, Chicago Torture Justice Center, exists to serve individuals who have been tortured by Chicago police or individuals who have been impacted by state or just police violence or communities who have been over policed and they're impacted by that and the violence that happens in their community. We provide therapy services. Um, I am now director of peer reentry services. So my goal is to provide individuals who like Gerald Reed, who just came home a couple of weeks ago with services that would allow him to successfully reenter society and have the services that he needs. So that is, you know, uh, some, just a little bit of Chicago Torture Justice Center. Yeah, and welcome, we all welcome Gerald back. That's really wonderful. Um, yeah, and for those of you who are not familiar, please do go look and check out the work of the Chicago Torture Justice Center. It was part of a historic reparations package, which not only included the formation of the center, but also a, just a revelatory um, school curriculum um, called Reparations Now, and then also a fight that we're still trying to um, bring into being, which is the Chicago Torture Justice Memorial, which will transform the landscape of our city to become more just. Yeah, so thank you so much, Latanya, for your work there. Um, Floyd, can you talk to us a little bit about your efforts, um, sort of where you've come from and also the work that you're doing now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, um, 
The work that I'm, um, where I come from, first of all, I'll start there. I come from the west side of Chicago. I'm um, a native um, from the Austin community. Um, family also comes from North Lawndale. So those two communities really largely helped shape my life. Um, particularly, um, these are communities that are primarily African American um, and primarily um, socioeconomically the working poor. So um, what um, I had the advantage of living in the Austin community, I bordered um, an area called Oak Park. And Oak Park was a village that had access to a lot of opportunities. Um, public safety was um, really um, um, incredibly high um, and, you know, I, I, growing up, I was just really like awestruck that like how um, a few feet can like really change like, you know, a world of difference between the two communities. Um, so, you know, that kind of helped me shape aspirationally what I felt that could happen in my community and what I felt my community needed, which was access to resources, public safety, quality education. Um, and throughout my life, I think basically I've advocated for all of those things um, in some way, form or fashion. Um, but like because um, of the, the experience I had with the criminal justice system, which, um, you know, in turn, I have um, a, a felony conviction, a criminal record. That is what I chose to focus on because so many, it was in my own personal self-interest and so many of my peers in the community were going through a lot of the same challenges as far as coming back to the community um, after release um, and not really having opportunities, wanting to change, but not having opportunities or feeling like there really was a way um, for them to change and re-enter society as a positive member, which leads me to um, work I've done with the Alumni Association, which is um, a positive support network of formerly incarcerated people, primarily from Cook County Jail. So uh, basically, uh, me, several other individuals, um, we uh, connected and we said, listen, the two main things we wanna do is we wanna stay out of jails and prisons and we wanna reintegrate with, like with our families, back to our places as fathers, as sons, as brothers, mm -hmm. you know, and really capture our healthy parts of our identity in a safe space. So um, the Alumni Association was created and, and what it is, it's really a relational um, type of engagement where um, you have older members who've been, you know, re-entered society for, um, you know, a considerable amount of time sharing resources, sharing knowledge, sharing information, but most of all, really keeping each other lifted up, really keeping each other inspired and really keeping each other encouraged. You know, we, we like to move at what I call the speed of trust, which is like, you know, until I don't have trust with you, until I haven't like really shared my values and become vulnerable and try to create spaces to heal and restore, then, you know, it's really hard to move forward and do work, right? It's really hard to help shape people's lives, um, you know, to the best of their ability. So, you know, um, a lot of my work really has to do with individuals with criminal records. Now, when we look at communities like Austin and North Lawndale, we also notice that public safety is, you know, on, on uh, extenuating circumstances, it's really a big issue that goes on in the community. So a lot of my work, I also, you know, started to work on violence prevention initiatives. So I was formerly um, a community project manager um, with Ready Chicago, which is a Harlan Alliance initiative, really like laser focused on reducing violence um, amongst the perpetrators and victims of gun violence in several communities, um, Austin Inglewood um, and North Lawndale. So, you know, I like to, you know, be in spaces where one, I could use my identity to help push and inspire people and help them move forward and also share resources and also be able to like work on policy initiatives as well, you know, to make sure that, you know, just from top down that we're making sure that everyone's understanding the issue that's going on. Um, and we having, we're centering the, the lives 
of those directly impacted in individuals. So those are the individuals that we're going down to Springfield advocating for, you know, and making sure that they're having an opportunity to speak to legislators, tell them the issue, understand the barriers. Um, I can go on and talk about Harlan Alliance, another um, one of the most promising initiatives that I had opportunity to work on was the Fully Free Campaign. So Latanya had spoke about like these collateral consequences that we, we um, individuals with criminal records experience, which are really like these civil legal penalties that really remove you like from really having an opportunity and second chance, you know, at, at, at a healthy life. So um, the Fully Free campaign is really ambition, ambitious in that it seeks to, there's 1,189, it's about 1,200 codified barriers that are like on the books in the Illinois State General Assembly, right? So we know that um, eliminating one of those, you know, it would take like my lifetime, my kids' lifetime and so on before we were able to really cast a wide net. So we're, what, what um, the Fully Free Campaign seeks to do is, you know, really cast a wide net and um, potentially land to omnibus legislation to be able to eliminate all of these barriers which restrict access and rights in the areas of housing, education, employment, healthcare. So um, that was one of the, um, probably about the, um, the most innovative type of um, legislative campaign that I work on. And I'll say lastly, Lisa, that um, I didn't get a chance to include in my bio that this is actually a really good time for me because I'm excited to announce that um, I'll be joining the Staines Family Foundation at the beginning of the month as a program officer. Um, and part of my responsibility will be to manage the violence prevention, criminal justice and safety portfolio. So Lawndale is like a full circle uh, community for me. I re-entered in North Lawndale. I get to come back to North Lawndale to continue to work on wonderful initiatives to create a safer community there and beyond. Yay. Yay. Congratulations. <laughs> not just, I'm not just happy for you, but for everyone, especially people in Lawndale, because the Stains is really such an amazing foundation and you're just going to make it that much better. So that's wonderful. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And um, I just want to say to those of you who are putting Q and A's, don't worry, we're going to get to it in just a couple of minutes. Um, we're just going to talk for a couple more minutes. And so I see your questions, please keep them coming. They're really good. Um, and I love Floyd, how you mentioned how not only are you working on incarceration, but you're thinking about mental health, you're thinking about housing, because these things are all connected. And in an unjust system, um, they try to silo these issues from one another. And you can't talk about police violence without talking about public housing, without talking about public education, and you can, without talking about public health. You know, So I love how all of you are working within these um, fields to bridge these barriers. Um, at the National Public Housing Museum, we're the only cultural institution that's dedicated to telling the story of public housing in the United States. And part of the thing is, in a country that spends $80.7 billion a year on the carceral system that, in, that incarcerates a staggering 688 people out of 100,000, the sort of one of the biggest forms of public housing in the United States is actually our prisons. We invest more in prisons than we do in public and affordable housing in many different communities. And so for us, a lot of the work that we do is thinking about how do we create a more just system where people can be thinking about housing for everyone and dismantling the carceral system system as we do that and providing fair and equitable jobs. Um, one of the things I was wondering uh, when you were talking, Latanya, is also like if you could unleash your radical imagination and, you know, just sort of pass one law or create one program that would make this world more just, you know, like what would it be? That's <laughs> that's a heavy question because like Floyd, I, I'm I'm in several different places. So I couldn't just pass one law for individuals who are formerly incarcerated. I would have to pass laws for individuals who face domestic violence, individuals who have um, issues with um, gender and identity, how society treats individuals, immigration. It, it couldn't just be one law. Really, it, it could not be. And I, I, I know that's like taking the easy way out of it. Um, and my heart, 
Um, I'm, a, I'm a housing case manager. And as much as I am connected to the carceral system and to the collateral consequences, I think about how housing affects all of the other intersecting oppressions. Because if you do not have some place to live, which I believe is a fundamental right. That's right. If you do not have some place safe to live, I don't understand how our society expects people to succeed, be functional, you know, have families, be educated. I don't, I don't understand without some place safe to live. So if I could change one law, <laughs> I, I think, oh my, I'm sorry. Okay. I think it would have to do with housing. You know, yeah. I, I, I want to choose so many other things, but I feel like I'm on the cusp of, of things with the carceral system. And, and I, I feel like um, to a certain degree, we don't know the depth of housing and how it is, it is just as unequal. And, and, and just, there is no justice in the housing system either. I see it from the inside every day. So I would have to choose that everybody would be housed. Everybody yeah. would have the opportunity to live in a safe neighborhood. You know, I, it's, it's, that's challenging for me. It really, no, really. I hear but. you. And obviously I agree with you. And I mean, also you are so smart in talking about safe housing, you know, thinking about Breonna Taylor and other people who don't have a right to actually feel even safe in their own homes. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so Floyd, what about you? There's a question actually from Melissa in our, in the chat box, sort of asking, what are some of the laws that actually currently exist in Illinois that we would want to dismantle, but you know, like what other kinds of laws might you want to, um, you know, pass? Yes. Um, that uh, similar to Latanya, I, um, the question, it, it, it made me think in a thousand directions, right? Of what, <laughs> you know, but, um, so I'll, 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 I'll answer. Um, so I'll say, um, some of the laws that are currently on the books, um, I can just choose some things that really, um, I think speak to individuals with a criminal record um, where there are these um, absolute bars to entry or like um, a very long waiting period for you to demonstrate some sort of um, change, um, then you will have an opportunity to enter yeah. the field. So um, I think one is, um, you know, something that, that I um, really believe is that you know, people um, like myself and, and Latanya and others, you know, um, because we've been through a particular set of experiences, we really can connect with um, particularly like kids in a preventative way, right? In a proactive way, swim further upstream to be able to go into schools, right? So I know that, um, you know, currently like if you wanna be a school social worker and you have a criminal record, you know, that's like a huge challenge. You can't do that, right? So I think that, you know, that prevents like conversations from happening, right? That pre prevents from a sort of type of bonding that could occur um, where, you know, um, individuals like us can be able to go into schools and be able to share our narrative and our story. And also, you know, just, just talk to kids, right? Because that leads to my second thing. And I think the, the pandemic really exposed this, you know, the world is hurting. Like there is a need for so many um, ways to deal with trauma and to create healing spaces for people to heal in a safe, brave way because when people don't have the opportunity to heal, what happens is you continue to go on, but there's like this wound, this festering that continues to, you know, inhabit you and it can debilitate you and make normal things like self-care, you know, really hard um, to do, you know, so I, I feel that, you know, um, I'm all about trauma, you know, these days and like really about cultivating restorative and healing spaces. You know, so I'm really looking forward to, you know, getting to North Lawndale and other areas to promote that work. But that that would be kind of like two of my areas, I'd say. Yeah. And maybe let's talk a little bit about restorative justice and dealing with trauma. Um, there's a, one of the um, questions in the 
chat is around that. I know that the Truth and Reconciliation campaign in South Africa sort of defined four different kinds of truth, you know, forensic truth, which is just the facts of the matter that we have to acknowledge, sort of independent narrative truth, which is the truth that we all bring to the table and the sort of individual truths, dialogic truth, which is the truth that we have to deal with when people have conflicting kinds of stories, and then also restorative truth. And that's the most important and the highest truth which institutions and civil society is responsible um, to bringing about, including museums through exhibitions and other work. And there's a attendee who sort of is asking, you know, how is restorative justice a part of CTJC or, or your work, Latanya? Can you talk a little bit about that? So restorative justice, um, the work that I do at CTJC as a whole, we do transformative and restorative um, justice. And, and that is through our politicized healing. And when I say politicized healing, we know that our healing is connected to um, how we fight these systems of oppression, these structural and, and systemic and systems that have oppressed for hundreds of years. So that's we, we kind of go on the thought of if we can restore um, the fight and, and the healing and saying that you have a voice in this, because for, for many years, we're talking about communities who have literally been said, told, you can't have anything to say. You don't have a right to say anything. You, you get what we give you. You take the abuse that we give you. So our restorative is restoring as you said, our own individual narrative and that our voices count, we restore each other with that and we fight and it transforms how we operate from that point on. So when we use restorative, we mean it in a sense of we are fighting, we restore ourselves with our voices, we transform our communities and ourselves with our voices and then we take our healing and it is transformative because we make it about the systems and the politics and we say, no more, we're going to fight because now we know not only did we always have a voice, our platform is the politics of it, so. Yeah, I love that. And I was just, I was thinking about at the Apartheid Museum and Joburg, they have a beautiful exhibit that shows how many laws were passed um, every sort of week in order to make just un injustice stand as a system. Mm -hmm. Like it was sort of blacks cannot marry whites, blacks cannot marry Asians, you know, people cannot go into the marketplace at the same time. You cannot say, and they needed to actually work so hard to actually create these um, systems to keep injustice and that um, anti-apartheid activists had to work just as hard than passing laws, but the reason why apartheid won also was because it was a transformative movement that focused on arts, cultural, on the individual, on mental health, and thinking, and this sort of global heuristic sense of what it means to be a full human being, and I love the way you're talking about it, Latanya, because it's not just um, like to maybe answer the previous person's question, it's maybe not just about passing one law or passing a series of law, but really thinking about what it means to be fully human. Um, let me ask you both um, as we're as sort of additional questions are coming in, you know, this is a very um, incredible moment where the twin viruses of racism and COVID-19 are being exposed. Um, it's certainly not, not new for so many of us, but for many people, there's like the are you know, it's impossible to not be awake to all of the violence and oppression and systemic um, issues that people that certain particularly people of color are facing. Um, how, where do you sort of see hope in this moment? And what movements do you think you want to invite people to join you in? And like, can you share and talk a little bit about that? Whoever wants to go first. Latanya, you're unmuted, so you go. <laughs> um, so I, I, I'm, I'm almost, um, it's really sad to say this, but I, I want to say I see the hope now and being heard. It is so unfortunate 
that horrible things have happened. We have George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. I, I, I can continue to name, but I think these unfortunate, horrible, um, tragic events have allowed for this season for us to be heard. Those of us who have been standing on the sideline saying these things when there was no tragedy, I, I can say, but we have been standing on the sideline saying, you know, the police aren't always right. They don't always get it right. The carceral system, you're incarcerating too many people. You're not, you know, there is no equity. People are always talk about um, equality. Some people need more. We need to focus on fairness and equity. So I think my hope comes from, I, I know my hope comes from that we are in such a heightened sense now of the inequity and the injustices that it is, a, it is giving room and it is being heard all over. And we have other countries that are saying, we are waiting on you all. So we're setting the standard for the rest of the world. And I, my hope is, is that with these tragic events, that laws can be changed, that everyday common people will be heard and that things will change because we aren't afraid to march. We aren't afraid to protest. This is the one generation where I've seen where they don't care about going to jail. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? So I'm like, yeah, they, you're going down there and they hope they get locked up, you know? <laughs> so, but, I, and I say that cause I, I just, I love all of the energy. And I love that at every protest, you don't just see African-Americans for George Floyd. You didn't just see African-Americans for Breonna. You saw everybody. So my hope is, is that everybody, we are just human. We are, we are all just human. And we all, if we have one voice to be heard and we say, that's wrong, no more, we're not going to take it. And we stand here today, not afraid to go to jail. <laughs> and, but that's my hope that everybody, not just black people, not just Latinx, everybody is saying no more. This, this is not the world I want for my children. This is not what I want for my grandchildren. I want so much more. And if I have to stand out here in the rain, in the cold, it, if I have to get pepper sprayed, whatever it is, I am fighting for that today. So my hope is, is that we are all locking arms and I see it every day. Yeah, what about you, Floyd? Yeah, um, man, I think just, just um, as Latanya said, um, I, I really feel that there is a critical mass of disenfranchised in the people in America. I think that um, folks are, are upset with the direction um, and the treatment of, you know, um, everyone, right? So my identity as African-American man, I, I'm a father, I have four daughters, you know, I have to have conversations with them about, you know, how to survive in America. Right, which are di very different than other ethnic groups, right? So what 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 I feel, you know, um, something that I feel is catching some momentum, uh, well, is starting to move past the conversation, um, is the issue of reparations. Um, you know, I want to squarely like focus on that because one, you know, the United States has a track record of providing reparations, okay, um, and then just now, like as of recent. Um, the township of Evanston, right? They um, um, they have a reparations package, and I don't know the deep details of it, but it seems like it's in the form of programs, housing grants, right, for African American um, residents of Evanston. Um, what I am in favor of is um, an integrated approach of not just some form of programs, right, but also direct cash payments. You know, so so for example, what would it look like? for you know, African-Americans and the descendants of African-American slaves to be able to have um, already an imbe uh, embedded like baby bond trust, right? For their kids, right? College 529 savings or something like that, right? So that way, you know, um, the young kids, you know, as they're growing up being African-American 
you know, college is no longer or like higher education is not an option. It's already there, right? It's already a, a pathway embedded, which we know going to college or going to some sort of secondary school can increase your chances at, you know, getting a job and um, having a career. And then, you know, if you couple that with, you know, like direct, direct cash payments and um, other programs, you know, I think that that is something that could start to shift the outcomes of particularly African-American men and women in this country. Um, but I would say that before anything happens, like the people who reparations are intended to go to, they have to be the voices that is centered and they have to tell us. So, you know, me, Latanya's, our legacy of people have to say, hey, this is what we want. This is what we need, you know, and then we need a government and an institution that's gonna hear us and respect us and, and begin to make way for things to happen. Yeah, amen to that. <laughs> I mean, I think one of the things that is so important in what you've said, and especially because we're actually, you know, speaking tonight and with the Illinois Holocaust Museum, is that one, we've seen um, nations pay reparations because they acknowledge the deep impact of historical injustice on people's everyday lives today. And you know the United States has paid reparations numerous times in the past, but not to the descendants um, of the transatlantic slave um, experience, and also um, you know not to even in Chicago. There's a project now that um, we are working on in the National Public Housing Museum to look at unjust land sale contracts on the west side of Chicago and the deep um, sort of exacerbation of the racial wealth gap that the plunder of black wealth that took place on the west side of Chicago because of land sale contracts. Um, and I wanna invite everybody to go to the National Public Housing Museum to learn about this project. Um, and you know, sort of this is history that is really just so close to us that we are not aware of. And we must go back in time and ask, you know, what have we not yet learned from history? How is that history still impacting us and all of the people um, that we are living with in society? And until we actually um, take account for the past, listening to those people's stories and also you know, really dealing with the his, the financial ramifications of it, like more, it'll be impossible to create a truly just world. Now, one of the people um, in the um, Q and A has asked, you know, like, um, how do we think about economic injustice in your work? Like, do you think that we should be focusing on home ownership example versus affordable housing to close the wealth gap. I don't know if that's, um, you know, if both of you want to maybe weigh in a little bit on that, that would be great. Thanks, Dana, for your question. I'm going to, I'm going to take a crack at that. And I'm, I'm going to, um, um, I'm going to say that the person who asked that question is my, my wonderful sister. So thank you. <laughs> And thank you for your thoughtful questions. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, yes, I do think that, um, so, you know, I think of what Latanya said about, you know, safe, affordable housing, you know, and, and, and so here's what I know, I'm having um, dealt with housing a bit, right, is that, you know, we need to one, preserve communities and areas which have a, like their communities of color, which have like all of this rich cultural history in these communities, right? We need to preserve that. Right. So, you know, um, I think that, you know, affordable housing coupled with pathways to home ownership, you know, everything is on the table, like everything should be afforded, you know, individuals, but, but in turn, I think, so I think the issue is right now we talk about sustainability, right, of, you know, now I have a house, how do I sustain it, we have to have, you know, we have to close the wage gap, right, whether it's 
across gender, ethnicity, every variable there is. We need to create a more equitable wage gap and then we need to start hiring folks, right? So the work me and Latanya do is so important about trying to remove these barriers because what we find is a lot of those barriers do live in housing, right? So for example, if you have a, a felony background and, and you try to um, access public housing, um, many times you may not be able to, right? Um, which may mean you may not be able to reintegrate with your family, you know? So like these are, we really need to like, just take a step back and look at the type of laws that are currently in existence and begin to create like a coordinated strategy to dismantle them so everyone can have access, you know, to public housing and home ownership. I absolutely agree. Yeah, I agree. There's no need for me to add anything to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I also, I guess I would maybe add a little thing, which is um, there's a wonderful book that came out by Kianga Yamada Taylor called Race for Profit, How Banks in the Real Estate Industry Undermined Black Home Ownership. And in that book, you know, Kianga asks, I think, a really critical question, which is, if we believe that housing is a human right, can we also imagine it existing in the sort of free market as a commodity? And you know, what are alternatives to home ownership that we collectively can unleash our radical imaginations to envision, including a lot of really wonderful movements now, include land trust movements that are thinking a little bit differently about home ownership that um, you know, one of the first land trusts started in Mississippi um, you know, by um, African Americans who were saying, we want to build wealth, but we want to build collective wealth, and we are not going to sort of buy into racialized capitalism. And so I think, yes, there's like, like Floyd said, I think it's wonderful, everything should be on the table. Um, and I think, including the sort of old models for how we think people accumulate wealth, there's a wonderful cooperative movement that's happening in Chicago now, pushing, um, and the museum store at the National Public Housing Museum will be a cooperative owned with public housing museums because um, co-ops are a way that people have shared wealth, you know, and we don't have to just reinvent the world um, like the old uh, tools and systems have presented. We can reimagine it, yeah. Um, so let me ask you another question. Uh, Barbara Scott has asked, um, can the panelists discuss how people with privilege, white privilege, help and use their privilege to move toward the goals that you're working on and the, and the projects that you're working on. Uh, you wanna go, Latanya? I, I... Um, well, I have to say that first, um, so I think we're just starting to have the conversation about white privilege <laughs> and entitlement. Like we've known that it's existed <laughs> forever. So I think, First of all, you have to acknowledge that you have existed, succeeded <laughs> from this white privilege, from this entitlement, and that's something that we haven't had. So first and foremost, acknowledge that it ex exists. And then I think you have to get connected. You definitely have, you, you can't sit from the seat of privilege and entitlement and say, oh, I want to help those people over there. Really, Floyd and I are ground level people facing every day. And that is the only way that you are going to be able to have an impact. There are always, there is always going to be somebody making top down decisions. Always. That's the way that it is. But if you really want to have an impact, you have to get on the ground level. It has to be grassroots and it can't just be, I'm going to write a check. You need to be seen and you need to be able to relate and understand you know, not, oh my, oh, I've never, I didn't know. We'll find out, find out. And that's how I have, that's all I can really say. It's grassroots, ground level, people facing, not just writing checks, not just saying what you want to do, not allowing the television to, to allow you to, to continue to walk in that stereotype of what you believe about this side of town or that side of town. Acknowledge that you've succeeded, that you've profited, and then say, hey, but I wanna help and I'm here to help. And then don't just show up 
and then, hey, I'm here on the west side of Chicago. You know, don't take no pictures. Don't write no blogs about it. Just be there and help. I won't add too much else other than that, uh, but I, I would say, because uh, I agree with everything Latanya is saying, I would say like, um, I think, um, you know, white people, definitely, if you want to help, you know, start to have those challenging conversations amongst your own peer group, call out, you know, those, you know, awkward moments or those jerky comments, you know, that are rooted in microaggression and racism, yeah. right? And like, start to call out your peers, have conversations, you know, um, I think that you know, collectively as a village, we have to like um, hold like the media and other institutions accountable, right? For a lot of like falsehoods and a false narrative. And I would just definitely say, you know, your professional dollars, you know, to, you know, organizations that are black led organizations or people of color led organizations, you know, that really helps, you know, to, um, you know, be able to give your professional dollars and then step back you know, and let, you know, the people who are really the most impacted by these issues do the work. Um, and I think like, as long as we're able to have these conversations, because truth be told, like um, me and Latanya, and, you know, I think all of the conversations I have from the most successful um, black person that I know, you know, to, to just like, um, you know, an average person, it's always like, regardless of what I have done in society, I still struggle with, you know, how the world sees me and how America sees and treats me because I'm a black person. And as we've been seeing with all of the racial, you know, and social injustice that have been like really coming to a boil lately, um, it's safe spaces are shrinking, you know, in my opinion for um, black individuals and we need individuals to invest in those spaces to have those difficult conversations and to cultivate equity so we can eradicate eradicate racism yeah and i i love um the way that latanya was saying you know just don't write a check that we need people to show up in all always and to express solidarity in all ways. But I also just want to say that um, I just dropped in the chat, for example, the website for the Chicago Torture Justice Center um, and also the memorial, that one way you can actually help is also writing a check and supporting these important initiatives that are underfunded and are recognized. And like what Floyd said, the, what you're doing is actually funding the work that allows people with the lived experience, people with the knowledge to be centered and to allow them to actually do the work that needs to get done, right? And so I think that's really, really important. And centering marginalized voices is probably one of the first, second and third steps of dismantling white privilege, right? And so I think that is really, really important. Now, there are actually a lot of questions um, related to asking you to share perhaps some of your personal experiences with incarceration. And I wanna be like one, both sensitive to those questions and maybe inflected a little bit with, you know, like the, somebody has asked, how did you stay strong? What were some of the, you know, tools that you used to, you know, stay, um, you know, to be yourself and to become, you know, fully human in spaces that would dehumanize you. Um, if you are willing to share some of those experiences, the um, people are asking in the Q and A. Sure, I, I could jump in. So, I, you know, I would say, like, you know, one thing is that, um, and I'm careful the way I will frame this, but in many ways, uh, my engagement with the criminal justice system actually. Um, you know, saved me in many ways because the dehumanization occurred in the community. You know, for me and for many, you know, um, black and brown individuals, it's the conditions that we live in in the community with the lack of resources and lack of, you know, infrastructure and just all of the oppression and, you know, the, the monitoring by the police. So I, just to painting that whole picture, that was the, the dehumanizing part. Now, mind you, you know, um, I spent five months in Cook County Jail. For me, it was a godsend because it took me out of a chaotic environment, which was the community, and it allowed me, you know, to really like figure out 
like one, I didn't want to go back to institutions. So I just started the slow work of forgiving myself. That's why, you know, I, as I said before, I really believe in being relational and moving at the speed of trust. So I was able to start having that conversation with myself, right? And forgiving and healing myself. And then to be able to stay connected with, um, by the grace of God, I have a great family. So they were my support system, you know, and from there, you know, they just, we, you know, it was an accountability thing and, you know, um, folks were sending positive energy and I was able to go. There was a place that I went to in North Lawndale called the Hope House, which is a Christian men's shelter, you know, mm -hmm. and I stayed two years there. So I was like embraced by different spaces that allowed me to move at the slow pace that I needed to, to re-enter society and um, do positive things in the community upon my release. Latanya? So I have to say, um, first of all, I had a very, very strong family support. Um, I remember after I had been found um, guilty, my mother said something to me that absolutely um, changed my life. I was in Cook County Jail. It was before I had been sentenced um, and went to uh, prison. My mother said to me, they only have your body. Let your mind be as free as you want it to be. So by the time that I got to prison, and at that time when I went to prison, um, the universities actually came into the prison. There was Lewis University, Roosevelt, um, Eastern Illinois University. So I set my mind on going to school. I said, if I have to be here, and I just kept remembering what my, what my mom said, they, they have your body. And I read everything. Literally, I've read everything. And I said to myself, and I've, sh I've shared this before, um, you know, I read the Bible, I read the Quran, I read the Torah, I was walking around doing mantras, I was doing everything, <laughs> because I was trying to maintain peace. And I wanted to, to live a completely different life than what had been written. So I read a story in the Bible about um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they had been um, sentenced to the fiery furnace. And while they were in the furnace, they prayed for deliverance. Short, I'm doing the short version of it. Um, I think it's in a book of Daniel. Um, but they prayed for deliverance. And once they came out, of course, they were delivered by God. And once they came out, it was said that they had been in the furnace, but they didn't even smell like it. And after I read that, I said to myself, I am in the furnace, but I promise you when I leave, I won't smell like it. Mm. And that is, is, is how I live my life. When I tell people my story, I've been in the furnace, but you can't smell it on me. Every day I prepared for freedom, every day. I did not have a life sentence. I always hoped to get out of prison sooner, but every day I said, one day you will be free. And I did not want to come out of prison looking like, sounding like, behaving like. So I read everything and taught myself everything. So how I stayed strong was um, informing myself, educating myself, my family. I would be remiss if I did not say that there is something so much greater than me that kept me. And here I am. Hmm. That's a really beautiful story. Thanks for sharing that, Latanya. It reminds me of a beautiful um, poem by Eve Ewing about Harriet Tubman, where uh, she says in it, you know, Harriet Tubman didn't go north because she wanted to get free. She went north because she knew she was free, you know? Amen. And yes. So, yeah. Thank you both of you so much. We're at the end of our hour. I see Raheem there. I want to really thank um, Floyd for joining us and all of the amazing work. Good luck in the Staines Foundation. Um, feel free to drop in the chat things that you want um, the audience members to go look into. Thank you so much, Latanya. I really appreciate all of your work and efforts. Um, to the audience, thanks for your questions. And I'm going to turn it back to you, Raheem. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you again, Floyd and Latanya. Um, I just would like to say, your message was 
extremely powerful and deep and thought provoking. And I 100% agree in the museum, we all agree. Uh, you are not your past, you're not your experiences. And we're all the same if we take time to understand each other and truly heal. You know, we're all the same. If we really take time to understand each other and that's what I took away from this and that you all are extremely important. And I would like to say to everyone that's participating or viewing, please take a time out to um, view our upcoming programs in the chat. Our survey is in the chat. Um, if you have a chance, reach out to Floyd, Latanya, Lisa, thank them for all the work they're doing. It does not go unnoticed. Even just one message can change one person's life, you know? Mm -hmm. Everything counts. And I truly appreciate you all for taking your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Good night.